Next up for compulsory viewing, the fab world of Jerry Anderson. Welcome to uh, BritCon 2021. Uh, my name is Steve Caldwell. I'm the general manager of Brie Events Northwest, a partner organization of BritCon in the Pacific Northwest region. And I'm here today to host um, a panel uh, called the FAB World of Jerry Anderson. And I'm joined today by uh, two fellow um, Brits who are also massive Jerry Anderson fans. I'm sure you probably know them already, but I'm going to get them to just introduce themselves a little bit more. So first of all, uh, Chris Thompson. Hi, my name is Chris. I am a uh, freelance artist, filmmaker, and animator and writer. Um, I currently do a lot of work with the uh, Jerry Anderson Estate and Anderson Entertainment. Thanks, and Lee? Lee Hi, Sullivan. Um, <laughs> I'm Lee Sullivan. I'm a comic strip artist and a uh, freelance dog's body, really. I do lots of kind of visual stuff. I've been working on and off with um, with Anderson Entertainment for a while, but before that, a massive fan of, uh, of Jerry's work and um, also Chris's work, who I'm profoundly jealous of. Well, I love your work too, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> I was well, before, before Little Love Best goes too far... Um, Perhaps we can kick off with just a, a general question about uh, Jerry. Um, so what in your views were, was Jerry's um, ethos mission in um, TV and filmmaking? Uh, what, what drove him, Chris? Um, I personally, I, the vibe I've always got from the Jerry Anderson shows is that there's been a sense of, right, this is a puppet show, but we're going to make the best damn puppet show ever made. Um, everything is written to like a super high standard. There's always like the way it's directed, the stakes, everything like that. It's like you're watching a feature film. When I was recently, like, I was rewatching Joe Ninety, Joe Ninety lately, and some of the plots in it completely overshadow plots that were going on in Mission Impossible at the same time. Like, uh, so I think it's just this wonderful sense of scale, which is ironic despite the small size of everything. But, uh, yeah, no, I think it's just the, like, epic vision and epic scale. Right. What about you, Lee? Oh, well, I, I concur with that completely. He was clearly someone who wanted to work in, uh, with full-size real actors, um, which probably became something of a curse later on, because I think he he found that puppets were possibly easier to uh, to handle at times. Yeah. But but I think that the uh, the thing that I was always very impressed with, I suppose as a child, I kind of under I got the benefit of it, but I understand it more now. Is that he was also very much aiming at an intelligent grown up audience via a children's program and so the wonderful thing about particularly from stingray onwards you have a really uh an attitude which doesn't take the audience uh as being the lowest common denominator they he tries to push a really good series that would appeal to adults and it just happens to be a kids program you know it's fantastic and that's why things like thunderbirds work so well because not only is the other production values very high, um, the intent is very high as well, you know. Right. Because I, I, I um, my, my view of Jerry is similar to yours, Lee, that, you know, um, he regarded puppetry as a vehicle for him to be able to um, demonstrate his uh, creative and filmmaking skills. Um, and one of the other things that were, was important all the way along, I think, was um, some of the key people um, in his life who um, assisted him for many, many years. Um, who do you regard as some of the key supporting cast to Jerry during the um, 60s and 70s? Chris? Uh, I think um, 
Sylvia's role can't be understated. Uh, like, I think particularly in... Um, there is always, anytime you go back and read those old, like, series Bibles and things like that, there's this huge sort of character bio for each each character, particularly in, like, Scarlet and uh, Joe 90, where, like, their entire life has been mapped out, and they almost never use it, but uh, it really helps out the actors and things like that, for what I've told, because, like, she would always be in the recording sessions, and she would always be trying to find, like, what that voice would be, or the emotions of the cast. Uh, obviously, Derek Meddings as well. Um, mm. And there was always a Derek Meddings because there's like Derek Meddings and then there's like Steve Begg and then there's the Dominic Laveries, uh like sort of later on. So uh, lots of wonderful teams that way. <laughs> right. What about you, Lee? Well, I think uh, Peveril obviously to begin with was a, a, a you know integral part of, um, of, of the Anderson universe and started it off. But I, I totally agree. Sylvia is kind of, because of the political situation between the two of them that developed after they uh, broke up, I think she's often given um, less uh, less of an accent than she really had on the series um, because they were joint producers, really. And they, uh, it's interesting that that probably... The, the intensity of working together probably in, in no small part you know, played a, 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 result, a, a part in their being unable mm. to be with each other. You know, it's, a, mm. it's a sadness that, that that kind of thing happens. But I think that I imagine that the, um, the stresses of working together as partners and as uh, romantically liaised people uh, is, mm. is an intolerable situation after a while because if you fall out one way with them, you're probably going to fall out both ways with them. <laughs> right, right. And um, I, I think the other key player in all this um, is uh, Lou Grade, Lord Grade. Of course, yeah. Um, because without his um, investment and support of uh, AP Films and later Century 21 Entertainment, um, non, none of well, not not necessarily none, but a lot of this wouldn't wouldn't have happened. No. But he was a difficult man to deal with. So I guess it it, it attests to Jerry's character persona that Blue Grade or was always finding new projects for Jerry, never thinking of actually firing him, even up to right up to his own retirement. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, but it, it is a, an interesting point in terms of um, the background to particularly the um, uh, voice characterizations that there's so many Americans in there. Mm. And um, that's because of, of the fact that Lou Grade was always trying to pitch these series to an American audience. I always find this quite interesting as well because um, obviously, uh, like, whenever Jerry worked with Lou, there was this element of, like, it, it, you could always come to Lou and, like, Lou would always, like, listen out and provide finance and things like that. And it always kind of feels like, because nowadays, if you go to, like, a company, you're dealing with, like, a huge board of directors and a creative team and things like that. Whereas in the 60s, you can just go to the guy with money and a cigar. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and that was Lou Grade. I mean, uh, he, he was, uh, and, and also, of course, he was in a unique position um, in the television industry in that he owned a production company, um, uh, ITC Entertainment, and also he actually owned one of the British independent television franchises, ATV. And so he um, could automatically commission his own work. <laughs> to be shown on his own network. And um, I, I guess that was a, an important factor uh, for Jerry, that um, he, he knew that anything he was was going to be doing for Lou was going to end up on the screen. It wasn't going to go in a scrap heap. Yeah. I think also that whole thing about his uh, just doing things on the handshake must have made life hugely easier for uh, any kind of production. It doesn't happen now. I, th I think there's just no 
I mean, I'm not very well versed in that, but you, you can tell that there are always dozens of people involved at any level of any production who can probably put a stop to it one way or another uh, and not necessarily help. Uh, and that is a terribly uh, frustrating situation to be in. And then you've got all the money people and then you've got, you know, ne network executives and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Lou was kind of like a whole, uh, the whole bundle really, so that he could kind of get things done virtually without answering to anyone, which, uh, and then knew his market well enough to be able to, that he knew that stuff would sell abroad and it was right. selling to different markets. And um, it must have been, it, it, it's a kind of a golden age of television, all of those series that were made then for ATV. You, you, they, there's so many of them. You can't believe that anything could be produced. I mean, all the kind of adventure series, plus, of course, the Anderson stuff, all being ch not churned out is a derogatory term. <laughs> but it, you know, it, it, uh, well, they were simply um, mass made, but they were all high quality things that sold really well and had great longevity as well, as we know now. Right. And, and of course, um, Jerry. Uh, didn't just do uh, sci-fi for uh, Lou Grady, also was involved in other projects. Um, uh, the one I remember the most is uh, The Protectors. Um, and uh, that was that was part of the ITC Entertainment's um, thrust into America. And that influenced um, the progression as well. Um, and maybe we can talk about the progression. Um, so we start off, um, but I think the first, I mean, he did things for the Ministry of Information, I think, and stuff like that, but we start off with, um, it's, uh, the adventures of Twizzle and, uh, Torchy, the Battery Boy, um, before the first, although not titled that, Super Mario Nation, which was Four Feather Falls, mm -hmm. and, um, so... Would you regard Four Feather Falls as, as really the the basis for the puppetry in the later series? I would say so. Like from um, just kind of like reading up on it, but also kind of comparing the jump between Torchy to Four Feather Falls, I think there was this element of um, Torchy is very much what you would expect from a puppet show, a kid children's TV show puppet show of the time, and then. And as far as I'm aware, they were making Four Feather Falls somewhat back to back on the, on the down low, that hoping Robert Delay wouldn't find out. Um, mm -hmm. In order to and like when you watch it, it's something like again, it's a Western action show. Like it's it's with puppets, but it's the kind of stuff that you'd see on the like in the pictures in those days. Well, there's another screen. Yeah. Oh, and I think again, it's it's all part of trying to make. Um... <laughs> In, in in a in a strange way, trying to make adult type films, but kind of reduce them down to a children's program thing. All that stuff, cowboy stuff, was massively popular. Yes, at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you couldn't move for the cowboy exploits on TV with their stagecoach wheels going backwards because of strobing effects. It always puzzled me. Oh, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> how is that working? I could never understand it. I didn't ever see Four Feather Falls until much, much later on. Yeah. But I did come in to see uh, Twizzle and um, uh, and Torchy the Butchery, no, the Battery Boy, <laughs> uh, who, uh, uh, I mean, they are as scary as you can imagine, really, uh, for, for kids. I, I mean, they look scary now to adults, but I love them. I really love Torchy. Torchy was an extraordinary thing, but I don't think I understood children accept things in a way that um that adults look at those puppets and they just think those are really i mean torture has got a really scary face um <laughs> i don't think that you know there are nightmares still you know um to be ironed out but uh, um but as a kid i was absolutely entranced by them i really really wanted a, a hat with a torch in it i tried right. to make one several times but there was always something sticking out the back. It was always a nightmare. Really. Actually, my dad's bike torch. That's, that's what I had. So you, you could have become a miner, Lee. Yes, I could have. I could have done. Uh, but I haven't got the hands for it. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
soft, uh, soft hands, artist yeah. hands. Uh, yeah, so uh, Four Feather Falls um, kicks off sort of the Super Mario Nation era, and um, that involved um, uh, two, two key players who were with um, Jerry for a long, long time. Um, that was um, uh, Reg Hill and um, I forget his name, Reed. It was part of uh, AP Films. Um, the, the the progression then. So, do you think either of you think that actually in Jerry's mind there was any thought that um, these kids like these well, sounds a little bit older than me. Um, I sort of kicked in with Bible XL five, um, but that Jerry had in his mind that maybe these kids are going to be adults one day. Mm, yeah, I, I'm uh, sure about that. Actually, uh, it's my favourite thing about being my age, which is obviously uh, I, I can't reveal to anyone, but you can guess. Um, but I was born. I was born in 1958, and that, that made me extremely lucky for watching uh, Jerry Anson stuff because it meant that by the time Supercar was doing the rounds, I was probably three or four years old, and that was absolutely the right age to be watching that and to be getting the toys, a lot of which I have behind me here. Um, and, uh, and they, oh yeah, I can, I can actually swing this round here. There's a, there are a few more things in the background there. Look, there's some, there's some Thunderbirds and some supercar things. Cool. And all the dynamics, obviously, um, and phasers, but there you go. Um, yeah, so, uh, but I think that was extremely fortunate um, for me because it meant that I grew up uh, knowing that, um, well, each series actually seemed to have its own age group. And I happened to slot into the age group that, that it was kind of aimed at because each one got progressively more sophisticated um, and looked better each time. Fireball was my absolute I, I I can't tell you how much I loved Fireball. It was <laughs> it's it's almost unnatural how much I liked Fireball. But um, but that was exactly the right time for me. Stingray became. I wasn't so keen on submarines, but uh, uh but it, the whole show was much more sophisticated, and the music had started to become in, in amazing as well. Obviously, Barry Gray's stuff yeah. uh, started to become really really uh, prevalent then. Um, and then Thunderbirds, again, another level of sophistication where you're dealing with adult situations, completely adult situations um, in a kid's uh, kids show format. Um, and then, then Scarlet, oh, where, where are we up to? Thunderbirds. Then we get Scarlet and stuff. And that, that really became, I, when I, at that age, I was starting to feel slightly adult anyway. So that, again, it, also, it fitted in very nicely. You know. Joe Nike was a bit of a shock. <laughs> he was then slightly younger than I was. I really, you know, I, I, he, he, I, I admire, I wanted his, uh, his uh, attache case. Mm. Right. Uh, I think it's... Carry on, Chris. After you, think. No, no, no. I'm, I've, I've, I've got nothing else to say. <laughs> <laughs> I stopped at day 90. That was it. <laughs> I was just going to say, it's interesting because obviously you watched them sequentially and aged up with them. I, I was... Thunderbirds came back in 1992 when I was two. Uh, I kind of watched them like... I would have watched them Thunderbirds, Scarlet, Stingray, Joe 90, which is the order I think they were re-released in. And then I had to like go back and sort of pick up the other ones on the rebound. So um, it was uh, it's 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 intriguing, sort of like how obviously our perceptions are differ a bit. Because like by the time I got to Fireball and Supercar, I was a bit like, okay, <laughs> like gotta gotta ease into these because they're a bit they're a bit older. Not I do love them, like, but uh, I remember um, when I got to Fireball, like uh, it didn't quite match up to the comics. Like, because uh, like, <laughs> well, Mike had set the bar so high, <laughs> Mike Noble, right, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, when you go to the show itself, and it's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's really interesting. I've always wondered what it was like for, for younger folk coming at it sort of mm. sideways and different angles, because um, 
uh, you know, because it was it all seemed completely natural to go from one series to the next to the next to the next, and you forgot the last one. I mean, that's the other aspect of it. Uh, as soon as Thunderbirds came along, I couldn't remember Stingray at all, except by the music. Also, because they were not being shown anymore. That's another interesting right. thing. You didn't have access to those shows anymore. What you did have access to, which Chris alludes uh, there to, is to TV21 comic, or TV Century right. 21, whichever way they like to call it. I well, call it TV21. Because we had in the 90s. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> well, but um, that was um, a in the 1960s. A fantastic comic was put together. Uh, I'm not really, really sure about the origins of it. I guess it comes from Anderson. Uh, it, in um, so we, um, it was Alan Fennell and another guy. Basically, they were opening up their own sort of, I, I think it was something like Fireball was doing really well and Stingray was doing well, and they decided to open up their own publishing arm. So, like, it was TV21 with its own internal thing that they produced and uh, they were able to i don't, don't think they even partner with anyone they just started producing their own comics like not on site but just from the company as well uh, and wow. the, the, that, that merchandising the merchandising and the comics were quite integral to um su supporting the whole um uh expansion of popularity of the programs yeah. um, because it, um, it was in people's literally coming through the letter boxes or in the news agents um, in the shops, even when the series weren't being shown. Yeah, and exactly. it was, it was interesting that when the, the relaunch happened in 1992, um, it, it wasn't lost on Jerry. And of course there was a big drive at the same time for the merchandising again. And I believe that Tracy Island was the most popular toy in Britain in either 1992 or 1993. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dad had hell getting Tracy Island, and he had hell getting Cloud Base, and absolutely no problem getting Marineville. <laughs> <laughs> That's strange because the Marineville is really nice. I think it's, yeah. a, it's a really nice toy. <laughs> yeah, I got the, I got the uh, Tracy Island too. Um, I don't know where these are. I've been up in the loft recently. I can't find them. I just don't have room uh, yeah. for all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, But, yeah, the, 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 I think the, the interesting thing about TV21 back in that time was that it, it managed to consolidate uh, all of those series up. You know, I remember being reading TV21 and them announcing that Thunderbirds was coming, and that was kind of really exciting because i had no idea what it would be um but we knew already because stingray was the, the current show although it had been off off air for a while i guess um and we knew thunderbirds was coming because it told us in tv 21 and there was another comic uh which had lady penelope's adventures or lady penelope as i uh confidently <laughs> thought her name was at those times with her shuffler parker which uh, uh, again another right, right. <laughs> I, was, I was still getting my vocabulary in gear. Um, but that stuff, um, it, that backwards and forwards consolidation between the TV series and the comic strip world and also articles, because TV21 was laid out, particularly in the early days, as a kind of newslet, newspaper uh, from the 21st century. Uh, it, it, it was a terrific world-building thing for the Anderson uh what what's become the Anderson Empire, you know? Um, well, and it was thing, uh, um, uh, in the I think it's the Astron War comic in Final X of Five is um, Lady Penelope's first appearance. Uh, like, in literally, the the strip just stops. Lady Penelope turns up, like captures somebody, and then <laughs> goes back to being Final X of Five again. <laughs> Yeah, it's great. Very good. I, I think that was whoever was behind doing that, I guess Fennel, but um, uh, genius stuff to do that because to a, you know, a keen reader of the comic, you would really pick up on stuff like that. And then, you know, uh, and and also later on, they would start to introduce Fireball Craft into other uh, um, stories. Like the, the, there's a sort of crossover of TV, of uh, Scarlet and the Fireball stuff from time to time you get that kind of stuff going on and it's it it was wonderful for a, a kid to 
think that the worlds were actually connected as well. Right. And I, I, I uh, do want to come back in terms of the, the whole progression and the legacy business, um, the importance of uh, uh, Barry Gray's music. Mm. Um, I, I'm a big fan of um, the Ukulele Orchestra of Great Britain. <laughs> and um, they do a fabulous version of the Thunderbirds March. And so there, there are people who are being, um, even today, probably somewhere in the world, there's an orchestra who's probably maybe banging out a Thunderbirds theme or maybe one of the other show themes. And I, even last night, when I woke up in the middle of the night for my usual bathroom visit, when I was trying to get back to sleep again, I had in my head the whole stingray, <laughs> you know, standby <laughs> for action. <laughs> Anything can happen in the next half hour. And um, the water, the water, the water, the water. yeah, that's, that's it. That's it. It was a it was a water feature. That's that's what it was. <laughs> early. Um, so I, I, I want to come back. Sorry, carry on. No, 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 no. So, no I, I'm, 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 I'm totally uh, taken by the whole bath, bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Just swept away. <laughs> so. Um, in terms of, let, let's just uh, take a look. Um, there's something about Sting. So in terms of progression, there's something about Stingray that gets introduced, which I think is probably the first time, in the sense that there are um, little subplots. And um, it, it's it's almost back to down to this, you know, well, I'm sort of building to a, an adult audience maybe eventually. Um, because of the, um, the the triangle between Atlanta oh, yeah, Shore, yeah. Um, Troy, and Marina. And uh, we sort of, I mean, I wish there was an, actually a follow-up romance series about all that, because I think it would be really good watching. <laughs> I, I have noticed sort of on a rewatch. It's racy, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> I have noticed on a rewatch of the show, but they really do cut that out towards the end. <laughs> like I think by the halfway mark, they're like, "Okay, right, Troy's dating Atlanta. Let's move on." <laughs> <laughs> uh, and of course, we um, we also had in um, Stingray. Um, I think that was the was that the first use of, of water in the. Um, well, I can't remember if Fireball. Uh, yeah. Water and Fireball and used water and supercar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Supercar was the first water thing. But yeah. um, <laughs> that'd be another one that will wake you up in the middle of the night. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I saw it down that path. <laughs> it dives under the sea, you know. Uh, yeah. and, um, uh, no, I, I think, but the water stuff was, was tremendous. I, I remember being really impressed by having little fish floating past all the, uh, all the various things. And, and it was a long time before I realised that it might be a trick. <laughs> right. And has anyone actually produced um, a dictionary of translating the uh, uh, Aquatans uh, language that they use in, in the fish? <laughs> Because that, that's, I, I think that's the, the only time we get anything right clean on, isn't it? <laughs> you know, <that's> You're a <laughs> blundering fool. Leo, you were lost in entertainment. You clearly should have... Yes. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think entertainment escaped a, a terrible fate. <laughs> I, I, I love Stink. Stingray's got some great stuff in it, particularly I love Agent X20 because yes. he's such a rip of uh, Peter Laurie's character, but mm. it, it doesn't matter. He's just, he's just fabulous. And the, and the, it, he's this cowering, timid little twit who, who <laughs> bungles everything a bit like poor old uh, Zarin to Master Spy. Yeah, I, I remember at a convention once, and uh, there was his. Um, there's somebody dressed as X to Zero in his I Love Duke outfit. <laughs> like, it's just like so good. Right. Oh, dear. Almighty Titan. <laughs> You're blundering fool. 
How could you let them escape? Why do I keep giving you these jumps when you're such a blundering fool? How did you find out this information? I read it in the newspaper. Where are you? I read oh, it in the newspaper. <laughs> And um, oh I, th I think Stingray uh, introduced, introduced us to the concept of the um, disappearing building or fixture oh, yeah. um, because of Mar Marineville uh, disappearing underground when he was under attack. Um, the, um, so let's talk a little bit about the, the, model, uh, the models in Stingray. Um, what, which of the... Um, the models in Stingray impressed you the most? Stingray? Come on, Chris. Yeah, Stingray. <laughs> Stingray, okay. Nice. Stingray. Stingray itself, like, it's, um, I don't know, there's just something about it, like, a, I don't know if I can, yeah, have a, some more of it kicking about, but uh, basically, it just doesn't age. Like, uh, the compound curves in that thing, um, mm. like, I don't think I could improve it. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's such a nice remodel. I wonder if it, it's interesting because the, the way the models were designed then was by eye and by plans, I guess, um, and by making models directly using using sculpts, wood sculpts or, or base sculpts. And it'd be very interesting to know if you gave that same design brief to a 3D modeler, such as yourself, Chris, uh, um, uh, uh, how wh whether you would actually be able to even if the same people would come up with the same kind of design because it's a different kind of um there are different avenues to go down in 3d modeling than there are in actual modeling you know? hmm. possible like stingray is quite a tricky shape but i think i've generally been able to get it but i've noticed that like obviously there's like three different scales of stingray and then it's pretty accurate to each other and then they can never make the bread two twice like every single version of Thunderbird 2 looks dramatically different. There was um, some concept art went live recently for the planned CG version of Captain Scarlet and Stingray. Uh, this other company was trying to do a CG version along the same time that um, New Captain Scarlet was being made, so they stopped. But like they did some pretty interesting ideas. Stingray looked pretty cool there as well. Mm. But it was very, it was kind of, it looked a bit sort of, Techno wire, like a bit too sick cyberpunk. <laughs> right. So um, let's move on a little bit more in history, and then we get Thunderbirds. And um, Thunderbirds again is a, a progression in in a lot of respects. Um, one of which was the, the length of the episodes. Um, we we have a fifty minutes episode compared to most of the others with 25 and even post on the birds um until um the actual um hi hybrid uh, shows of ufo and space 99 were all still 25 minutes um i mean that must have been challenging to the script writers and script editors and um uh i mean jerry and sylvia were involved in that but i think also um was it was this a stage in which um Tony Barwick got involved, or uh, um, Alan, Alan Patillo? Alan Patillo, definitely. Um, not as sure about Tony. I think Tony Barwick's in there, but he definitely was on Scarlet. Um, yeah. I'm always kind of interested on the longer episodes of Thunderbirds, because I think most of them, like, one episodes like Terror in New York City and Operation Crash Dive, I think, are phenomenal. But I think a couple of them do struggle to match their running time at times <laughs> right it's interesting also that it was quite a, a a big commitment for a kid to watch a 50 minute right i mean i know that attention spans are supposedly much smaller these days um down to about five minutes i think is probably what anyone can take these days of any continual uh, uh storytelling but 50 minutes was a bit, bit of a stretch for kids and, and also ad breaks in the middle of them because yes, uh, yeah. they were all on the commercial stations uh, here and I guess obviously in America. Um, so you would get every 12, 13, 40 minutes, you'd get a break. And, uh, and so it was quite a, a commitment for a kid to sit and be there till the end, you know. 
but I think that the, the, the secret of that was that you have you've got two bits of each episode. You've got the first bit, which is the the, the amazing title sequence and the cutting in of bits from the episode. That's really clever that you've got what's coming up next. That's very, very, I don't know if the, the American shows were doing that then, but they, they certainly did afterwards. And it's a great way of showing you this is what's coming. You've got to stick around to this because otherwise, right. how will you know if they get managed to move the Empire State Building very slowly uh, uh, <laughs> somewhere else for some reason? Uh, and, um, uh, and, and the drama of that then kind of set you up, and obviously the great music set you up for then taking a much slower uh, approach to the to the storytelling so that you could let it unfold but i think that i think chris is right some of the episodes don't work so well but on the other hand the ones that do are like feature films you know they really are right. really, the, I, I i always think the, the very first episode is a magnificent it's the thunderbird film that never was you know it should it mm -hmm. should have been what thunderbirds mm -hmm. go the movie was you know that particular and although the storyline is very similar i'm i'm told but um you know it's it is we watched it, it, it's interesting i had some friends around uh, a couple of christmases ago and as a joke i said i've just got these blu-rays of um of thunderbirds would you like to see them because it's it's a bit different how you remember it maybe and we sat and watched the first um uh fire flash episode and there wasn't a peep. We just sat there and really enjoyed it. And they don't yeah. normally go back to that nostalgia stuff at all. But it it was riveting storytelling, and right. that was the the, the and everything about it was really really good. And I still love the burning tires. That is right, a detail. Yeah. It doesn't really need to be in there, yeah. but it's fantastically well done. I always love the noise, like the screeching brakes noise. But that yes. really horrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, is, is it true that um, uh, some of the sound effects were as simple as like a vacuum cleaner? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's the hollow bikes, isn't it? That's a, that's, yeah, yeah, that yeah. sounds like a vacuum cleaner to me. <laughs> the, the sound effects, actually, the sound effects are really. Uh, each series has got a really good particular sound effect that i love and fireball the 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 takeoff sequence and as it gets that second boost when the when the fireball's taking off and its own engines cut in that's tremendously exciting to me that will every time then that zesty ooh, in the in the sting in the in the music mm. And it's also got, I have to say this, I'm contractually obliged to say this every time I talk about Fireball, one of the best sequences ever, most simple sequences, where you're looking from behind Steve and Robert, and uh, and you've got the the space, you've got sky background, and then it's, it goes dark and the stars come out. That is really magical, and it's very simple, and it just works every time for me. Right. I really wish I was a spaceman. Yeah, and yes. Uh, I'd fly you around the universe. <laughs> 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 and, and it's interesting, the, um, there's two, two themes that strike me um, during the series. Um, with several of them, well, they're all, they're all sort of a, about international cooperation. And I think that that's something that jerry thought was important to preach to kids is the the value of well it's the world aquanautic security patrol uh world intelligence network um international rescue itself and um i don't know how much lasting impact it's made in terms of the way we've got the world today um but there are a number of things from the series that carried over a little bit into real life. And also we had some projections of the future. I mean, who would have guessed the video phone? Hey, what the heck's that? Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, do you I think like the, like, the video phone is such a big part of like 60s, 70s television. But anytime anybody tries to FaceTime me, I'm like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's I wish more people would would select sound only. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it would make this a bit of a trial, obviously. But um, yeah. right. <laughs> right. Um, so, what was your um, favourite Thunderbird? 
one. Um, it used to be four, but uh, there's just something about, I don't know, Thunderbird 1 and Scott in general. Yeah. Uh, I am I was a big Scott fan uh, back then. I've, be I've sort of shifted a bit over to Virgil and Thunderbird, but, but Thunderbird 2 has become my favourite craft by a long way now, um, simply because it is so preposterously, wonderfully big. And, you know, the, one of the great things I've always thought as an adult is that uh, it, it amuses me tremendously when you when you call for international rescue, you really have to be sure you've got a bit of a bit of a landing area for Thunderbird 2 to come in on because you're going to lose a playing field's worth of stuff under those <laughs> rockets when they land. And uh, and they do those rockets just for no reason at all. Don't they? They, they simply the craft can clearly hover by themselves, yeah. but the rockets are there just to put their mark on, yeah. on where they <laughs> land. Just to torch everything. Blow holes in in your sports field that you land on, and it's wonderful. Yeah. yeah One and, of the great uh, things about about the Anderson series, I think, it, it's something that appeals to me is is what I call swagger. It's the swagger of the, of the 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 bigness of the ideas. Every idea is massively oversized, so that Thunderbird Two. <laughs> it's so funny. It's a huge craft, and so to try and disguise it a bit, they put palm trees together, which are a bit a bit less wide than it is. So they have to spring down so that the big craft can come out. But but it's not just that. That's the that's a nice nice detail it's the fact that a whole cliff face has to be removed down in order for it to come out it's there's no small little doors that <laughs> yeah that are disguised it the whole thing has to move yeah and, and, um, to be honest with you uh here in the pacific northwest and particularly um in the seattle area we're not very far from uh, mccord air force base where uh, the big uh, cargo transporters come in oh, yeah. um, and sometimes I get very, very close. I'm actually very close when they are uh, to the runway and they're coming in. And sometimes I, I sort of in my head think it's Thunderbird 2, it's coming into yes. land. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anytime there's like an air show and you hear a Vul Vulcan bomber flying over, that's the noise they use for Thunderbird 2. So it's right. just like, wait, what? Oh, okay. Is that actually right. what they did? Did they use the Vulcan? I think it's a Vulcan, yeah. Oh, right. Right. Okay. So, I, I remember there was a Japanese monster movie called The X from Outer Space, and they didn't deliberately use the Thunderbird 2 noise, they used the Vulcan as well, and it sounds the same. All right, that's right, interesting. Right. The Vulcan was an amazing aircraft. I, I, I saw it a couple of times uh, flying, and, 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 and it, again, it, it's one of those things that happens in the, the special effects department. One of the great things, and one of the things that they really got wrong in the the, the new version of Thunderbirds is the scale of the things and the scale is denoted by the speed at which they traverse the screen and the Vulcan I couldn't have figure out how it was staying up in the air because the, the, this big craft is like that and it seems to be doing this <laughs> it, should just, <laughs> it should just drop out of the sky but Thunderbirds yeah. uh, uh, again the, 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 it, everything, it, it's done slowly and massively the mass is very very important in those um, in those scenes and I think it's something that I think was deliberately uh, ignored for the for the latest uh, iteration of Thunderbirds to its detriment I can't understand I can't understand thinking at all behind it it made them look like toys yeah, I, I, I thought at one time that um, um, none of the Tracy brothers could actually really walk because they spent so much time on conveyor belts <laughs> and uh, sliding things going in. Um, I, 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 I don't know where that came from, but it's it's always it's it's one of the more memorable things to me. Um, mm. In terms of it, is actually the launches and uh, Thunderbird yeah, yeah. One, Thunderbird One was. Uh, uh, coming out of the um, swimming pool that moves apart, and Thunderbird Two with the palms that fall flat on their faces. I don't know who waters them, but they're clearly not doing a good job. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. it's will have to be live that they keep slapping the ground with. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, so talking about the characters, because we we we've only touched on characters a little bit. Um, Tracy Brothers, um, 
he was uh, I was always interested in in John because he featured so little. <laughs> Poor John. And I had no idea, you know, I, I had every idea what Scott was about or Virgil was about. And, well, I had really no idea of John. I mean, who was your favourite char character in, in, in the show? And maybe it's not one of the Tracy brothers. Well, like, I always hear to Scott just because uh, Shane Rimmer just sounds awesome. Um, and he had the coolest Thunderbird. But the... Um... <laughs> Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> I have to say for legal reasons, allegedly. Um, yeah, no, I think there's something about Scott, like, particularly whenever, uh, like, he's just always so cool, like, when he lands and trapped in the sky, and he's just like, yeah, well, there's 300 people there that's going to die if we don't do anything. So what's it going to be? <laughs> yeah. It's like, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to sound like you. <laughs> yeah, I, I think with some, some of it, definitely with some of the disasters we have going on in this world, we could do with a Scott Tracy just managing it all so calmly and coolly and telling people where to go and I and, think we just uh, need Shane back so we can just kind of narrate everything and be like I don't think we're gonna make it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he's always yeah. bossing people about to get his blooming mobile unit out of Thunder. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's right. You know, the first thing he does is soon as he like, I need some help with this, by the yeah. way, guys. We're an international rescue organization, but I can't get my kit out of Thunderbird. Well this is the thing Graham, uh, when Graham did the cutaway at Thunderbird 1, um, not only did he give it this, like, really cool, um, it's like its own pod bay system, like, the bottom of the blue bit, like, oh, drops yeah. down, yeah. but also it's got, like, an Atlantigrav unit for the, uh, for his uh, mobile control. Yeah, well, okay. it, it makes sense, that. makes sense. But, like, it's, just, right. it's surprising they didn't actually show that, because it's kind of, right. it, it would have made sense within the, within the storyline system. Yeah, Graham is very, uh, Graham Bleathman is a great uh, reference uh, for, I did lots of comic strips of Thunderbirds. I did five years worth in um, uh, in a British magazine uh, and he was the go-to guy to see, you know, because there are always those scenes that a writer will write in like, for example, Scott exits Thunderbird 1. Well, you know, I mean, there are a number of ways he could do that, mostly by falling out of the hatch. Um, but I, you know, I, I kind of try to to look at how uh, they've been done in the cutaways, and Graham, so Graham was always very useful for that. Um, so maybe moving on one more show to Captain Scarlet. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the main progressions there really was... Um, how, how dark that series was and um, how all the any comic aspects of uh, any of the shows disappeared. Why do you think that was? Um, I think partly just because they wanted to adult things up a bit. They wanted to do a war story and it just doesn't lend itself to as much humour as the previous ones did. Well, also, it's primarily about people being killed, isn't it? War, <laughs> <laughs> war, <laughs> it starts with him being killed, and then very mis in in rather strange and un uh, 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 I never they never really quite. I've never been totally happy with the way Scarlet is retro metabolized, and uh, it doesn't quite make sense the the whole thing. But uh, it was at the time I was des it, it was very serious, and and it, and it was taken very seriously by the kids. I mean, we took all of the series very seriously, but again, this progression in age. Um, you know, you've got Scar Scarlet is 67, isn't it? So I would be nine, at the I'd be Joe 90 sort of age at that stage. Um, and, uh, and all that death was fantastic because at the time, uh, kids would be running around murdering each other uh, in a, you know, in an imaginative uh, way uh, in the playground all day long by firing machine guns at each other. Um, mm -hmm. in their mm -hmm. imagination. So that whole thing of the the people dying and blood and guts, um, it was the first it was the first series to sort of deal with that, I suppose. And it was it it really picked up on something that, that young boys particularly uh, mm -hmm. murderous little wretches that they can be um were were really just heavily into, you know. Right. And, and graveyards um, as well. Captain Black yes, yeah. and Rotten mm -hmm. Man, clearly, it certainly were both of comic strips. Someone who was just dead and walking around. Marvellous. Mm. There was a really bit 
Uh, there's a really uh, cool bit in one of the episodes with Captain Black where he's uh, it's firing 15 and he's like turn the light off and then you can see me and then when the guy's right. like, he's in darkness and when he turns the light off he's glowing and it's like wow <laughs> like it's yeah. really, really effective yeah yeah uh, and that, that that show had um it's sort of was again um you know cooperating together protecting the earth um and but it, it did have uh, some new models as well um the spectrum pursuit vehicle um and the msb and cloud base itself um so we, we, in terms of like progression, um, how how does Captain Scarlet um, uh, link to um, eventually something we, we may not get around to today, which is UFO, in in terms of uh, preparing people for the like alien nightmare? Yeah, yeah. Um. Well, ironically, like I, my my thoughts on the production design of UFO, possibly for a different day, um, but um, I feel like whenever you got the transition between Thunderbirds and Scarlet is quite striking to me because in Thunderbirds you've got like a lot of colourful vehicles and hover cars and things like that, and Scarlet you've got traditional nineteen sixties cars and all yeah. the planes look a lot more sort of sensible, not like not, yeah. and everything's a bit more muted. UFO kind of goes straight back to Thunderbirds in a lot of ways, but um, I think there is just a definite all-round look toward realism in the show. Right. That's a match with the puppets. Right. Because the next next two shows, um, Joe 90 and The Secret Service, look to me um, to be you know, like the budget's running out and we're having to... Um, cut down on the um, amount of modeling and that sort of thing. Because there were other projects going on at the time in the Anderson Empire. Um, and it, it gave that impression. Although Joe 90, um, certainly the big rat, is uh, again a, an important model, I think, in the history of uh, Anderson. Um, but also, I was re-watching The Secret Service um, yesterday, and I'd forgotten how that was the show that actually introduces to the hybrid of the human actor and the and the uh, puppet, the caricature. Lady um, Martin, Lady Martin. Yeah, um, because you you have a scene with a police car and the, would have a real police car with a, a real, presumed stuntman, driving it, and then cut away to the more close-up, which would be done in supermarination. And um, it's, it's like, you know, again, almost like, Jerry's preparing us for the next step. It's it's a slightly uneasy balance, I think, in, particularly in that series. Um, it, it is a testament to how good uh, Meddings was um, with the and the teams generally were at trying to match live action with model shots. I mean, it works very well sometimes in UFO. Um, I think the whole, I think Secret Service is kind of, it's it was really the secret series because virtually nobody saw it. Uh, it was a very, very well kept secret on television. Yeah. I think you, I, I, I never saw it. It never appeared on my TV stations until, well, in fact, it never did. I, I saw it in videos much later on. And you can kind of see why, because it's, it, it's, it's one of the first series which I think they couldn't really, the concept was, it seemed to me, was just not properly thought through. And the, the blending of the, the, the models and, and puppets and live action, trying to have the same character, uh, it, was, it was really, really tricky, I think. But it was a very interesting experiment. Um, yeah, yeah, and it was also, of course, as, as, Lou, as Lou Grade said, you've got you've got Professor Stanley Unwin talking Unwinese, yeah, and to an, your average American viewer, yeah, yeah, I mean, it is intentionally unintelligible, but completely unintelligible to a right. Foreign yeah, I so would love to live in the like sort of parallel universe where like the Ameri the the Americans who were so obsessed with like the Avengers at the time would have been like, yes, the Secret Service, let's seven series as feature film franchise 
Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and I, I, I think that sort of um, brings us to a close on the superannuation era. Um, until, of course, you know, things you both of you have been involved in, which is the um, revival and the reinventions. And uh, I think that um, we will probably find that with the legacy projects that are going on, that people are going to go back and find some of these shows again, um, and, and hopefully to a, a new audience and an audience are all simply forgot about this. Anyway, um, it's time for me to wrap things up. I want to thank you both very much for participating in this for BritCon today, uh, Chris and Lee. Uh, it was good to meet you both, and I'm very impressed by all your stuff in the background. I've, I've already got my eBay account ready. So <laughs> looking forward to buying something. Anyway, thank you. Um, take care. Ha <laughs> ha! That was great! Hello there! I'm the Doctor, President-elect of the High Council of Time Lords, Defender of the Laws of Time, Protector of Gallifrey, and Eater of Unlimited Rice Pudding, etc, etc. You're watching BritCon! Don't go away! Ha ha ha! Is it me next?